Good morning, and welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council in Town Hall. I'm Rachel Kinderdine, Community Manager, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Age of Danger, Keeping America Safe in an Era of New Superpowers, New Weapons, and New Threats. Today, we are joined by the authors of Age of Danger, Andrew Hohen, Senior Vice President of Research and Analysis at the Rand Corporation, and Tom Shanker, Director of the Project for Media and National Security at the George Washington University. Our moderator is Jim Thompson, President Emeritus of the Rand Corporation and Professor at the Party Rand Graduate School. For those of you who would like to submit questions for our speakers, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can type in your questions. I'll be managing your questions during the Q&A segment, which should start in about 30 minutes. Jim, I'll hand the conversation over to you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, we're here to talk about this book which by, by our, the two authors, and we've already circulated their biographies as part of the invitation to this session, so we won't need to go into that. I'll just say at the beginning, it's a, it's a very interesting book in one dimension that we were just talking about before we signed in, and that is that Tom and Andy have spoken to, I don't know, 100 people who are experts in different aspects of the topics that they cover in this book. So you get not only the discussion of the issues, but you hear from the, the experts or the people or the actors who are part of the or part of the, the national security machine, as they call it. So um, let's start by just getting a general question to Andy and Tom. Why did you write this book? Well, for, thanks, Jim, and it's a, a great honor for us to be with you and all of the, the members of the Los Angeles Council. Uh, Andy and I firmly believe that national security is too important to be left inside the beltway, and we're really hoping to engage with a broader national audience. I think Andy and I shared one goal in writing this book, which was getting to a place of definitions, because how you define a problem defines the solutions and in many ways limits them. What we came to realize is that after 9-11, we define national security too narrowly and for too long as counterterrorism, and that crowded out proper attention to a whole other variety of risks just as serious, if not more serious, the ones we outlined in our book. Jim, just quickly, uh, you know, the having been involved in national security all my life, uh, we Tom and I really think there was too much of a inside echo chamber and not enough big debate. We really wrote this for an audience like this, that um, trying to make people aware of not only the problems, but who some of the key people are. And so I'm really delighted that you pointed to one of that features. You know, this is, of course, Hohen and Shanker's assessment, but we're really trying to tell the stories of the people that are working on these issues. Well, let's go back to your the the theme. I want to make sure we make we, we that the audience gets the main point. And, and I think Tom just covered it briefly, but that after 9-11, uh, when 3,000 plus people were killed uh, in the attacks on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, uh, the, 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 the country focused down on a combination of counterterrorism and the Middle East. And and your argument is that that caused the we we took our eye off the ball from a, from the point of view of grand strategy we weren't any more focusing on what was happening the developments and which, which were turning China into a national security threat the the fact that Russia even though uh, it, you know it had sort of disappeared for a while it was going to be coming back and then all of these different. Uh, technologies or other things which which have sp spread out the kind of threat we face germs uh computers and networks climate and uh, and um uh, i'm forgetting oh and and uh and uh drones you know, the four you choose in in the book and, and do i have that we, we sort of made a, a, a grand strategic error by taking a becoming too narrow is that the, is that is it fair to say that's what your idea is Jim our take on this is first off 
there, there were serious reforms that needed to happen after 9-11. We know that, you know, as, as you know, this audience now knows the light was flashing red. There were, you know, there were lots of warnings about, you know, the likelihood of a terrorist attack. In fact, we know from the deputy national security advisor at the time, Steve Hadley, who we interview and we feature in this book, that um, there had even been a directive to go after Al Qaeda with armed drones before 9/11. It didn't all happen in time, and so we, you know, suffered a tragic result. the The argument we're making is that those reforms were important, but as you characterize it, they were. It became an obsession, and and um, you know, we both narrowed uh, attention, and it lasted too long. I was in the Pentagon when that happened. I am rather certain that the leadership in the Pentagon, if you were to say in 2001 and 2002 and 2003, that nearly 20 years later, that, you know, we won't have focused on bigger, broader set of problems, they'd have been astonished. But once that was in place, that took hold. And so we think that choice to to narrow our choice, you know, our term is zoom, to zoom on, on those issues that it was uh, too much and too long, especially too long. And if I could just point out, you know, this is a very heartfelt anniversary week. This is the anniversary of 9-11. And as you said, Jim, 3,000 people died on that horrible day. And any death above zero is a tragedy. But from those 3,000 deaths, this country launched two wars, won the longest in its history, spent $2 trillion dollars, the whole country went on a war footing. We disrupted the architecture of the Middle East. Thousands and thousands of, of Afghans, Iraqis, and others died after 3,000 Americans died. Compare that to COVID. One million Americans have perished a pandemic. The number is going to rise this autumn. And this country never went on to anything similar to a war footing. There wasn't even agreement on the cause or how to respond. So Andy and I are saying it's time to stop circling the strategic cul-de-sac of the Middle East and look at other threats, not to forget terrorism, but to look at other threats that are perhaps even more existential in how they might hurt us. Okay, and in, your, in the book, you speak a lot about the national security machine, or you break it into two parts. Uh, the warning machine and the and the response machine, and I wonder if you could just you get, explain to our audience a little bit more about that because we're going to return at the end. Well, how do we how do we what do we need to do to repair these machines? But could you wonder what one of you explain? Yeah, I'll that? give it a start, Jim. In our, we we refer to warning and action, and of course, in between warning and action requires decision. But warning is all of the mechanisms that alert decision makers to problems and their urgency. Um, I think for this audience, uh, the intelligence community plays a very prominent role. And in fact, the intelligence community is the communicator. But warning isn't just coming from the intelligence community. It's coming out of the private sector. It's coming out of all of the, the feeds that we have about emerging problems, about the consequences of those problems, and of course, then the likelihood, the urgency of them. That apparatus, you know, has to be watching the right kinds of issues if if decision makers are going to be alerted. And of course, one of the things that happened after 9-11 is a lot of that apparatus was shifted and was was really focused on counterterrorism. And as you pointed out, Jim, the greater Middle East. You know, I'm going to let Tom tell the story because he wrote the chapter on Russia, but you know, there's some really interesting comparisons of when we went to Zoom, what really transpired there. So we've got the warning machine and then decisions. You know, decisions happen in a lot of different places, but big decisions are taken by the president, big, the biggest of the decisions. And then, but a decision isn't going to happen or nothing's going to happen with a decision if there's not a response or an action mechanism. So for the national security system to work as we think about it, you have to have warning. That is, there's a problem coming, and what's the urgency of it, and what's the what are the consequences? Then you need a decision, and then you need action. That is, you need to have the response mechanisms in place that are going to deal with it. 
you know, think of the military, of course, but the problems we're pointing out are, aren't just the military. As Tom alerted, you know, uh, already signaled when we think about public health preparedness, if you're going to respond to a public health threat, you need an action machine that is not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, focused on on research, analysis, and so forth, but it's operational. It's able to to then have responses in place that are going to provide for the for the welfare of the of the people that are intended. Our look in this book is really about all those mechanisms of warning, decision, and action, and to pose the question: Do we have the machinery in place? For the, for the kinds of challenges we face as a nation today? Our answer is no. And I know later in the conversation, Jim, you're going to want to ask us a little bit more about what do we do? We'll get back to that. But uh, you know, that's, that's really what we explore here. I want to say one more thing. We don't want to suggest everything's broken. And I'll give you an example. You know, we can debate about whether the response to Ukraine was speedy enough. We can de debate about whether some of the support at different times, the right things were happening, but the machinery was in place. Think about the, you know, the intelligence signals that happened. Think about how decision makers acted on that. Think about how we were revealing what Russia's intentions were through pictures that we were sharing with the world. That hadn't happened in my, in my view since perhaps Adelaide Stevenson showing photographs of the UN in the 1960s, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, that machinery was working. There was a decision. And then the action machinery in terms of providing support to uh, the Ukrainian government and importantly, the Ukrainian military, that all was there and it was in place. So the machinery is in place for some things. It's not for others. And what we'd really like to do is to get it tooled for the problems of this era. And Andy was kind enough to tee up Putin and, and Russia. And I, I spent five years living in Moscow, a time that my wife recalls as five winters. So, you know, Putin and, and Ukraine were very, very important to me. And, you know, the, the whole world, this country completely understands who Putin is now after the invasion of Ukraine a year ago. But remember, Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, Crimea, Donbass. We interviewed the NATO commander at the time, Air Force General Breedlove, a four-star. He said that before the first Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, he received zero tactical warning. It was an utter and complete surprise. This is the NATO commander with access to the crown jewels of American intelligence, satellite intelligence from the ground. He told us he flew back to Washington. He was incensed. He was so angry, he said, he went off like a well-hit nine iron in a tile bathroom, which is just a wonderful image. And what he was told, Jim, is how could we have been so blind to that first Russian invasion? He was told that at the height of the Cold War, before the Berlin Wall collapsed, there were 15,000 American analysts focused on the Soviet Union. By 2014, the first invasion of Ukraine, that 15,000 had dropped to one or 2,000. Very good people, but everything had shifted to counterterrorism in the Middle East. Similarly, the Intelligence Committee budget for intelligence before the wall fell was 50% of the intel budget was focused on the Soviet Union. By 2014, that had dropped to 15%, and it was watching not only Russia, but the dozen or more constituent republics that emerged from the Soviet Union. So this nation willfully blinded itself to what Putin was doing because we told ourselves democratization's coming, Russians are like us, et cetera. We just weren't watching because we're watching terrorism. Okay, very good. I think let's turn now away from Russia though to talk about China. Um, you you go through a, quite a, a, a very good and interesting discussion of the development of the China's the Chinese military and and economic and uh, and other threat. But I think there were a couple of points in in your book that I think the, the audience might be interested in, but in, with respect to the the Chinese threat and particularly the threat to Taiwan. The first is TSMC. That's the I think that's the Taiwan Semiconductor Man manufacturing company. And the second one is that I think unbeknownst to most Americans, the Chinese have over the last several years started building up their strategic nuclear forces. 
uh, really very, very much under the radar and hardly ever covered in the press. So you want to do what do you want to talk a little bit about these two issues and also what, what their implications are? Uh, let's start with uh, Taiwan semiconductor industries. Uh, it's you know it, it was one of the really important elements of research in this book was the high high concentration of advanced semiconductors. So you know chips are made in a lot of places around the world, but the advanced semiconductors, the advanced chips, the very high percentage made in Taiwan, made by Taiwan semiconductor industries. Uh, you know, 80, 85 percent of the advanced chips come from there. You know, I I was first began my uh, work in the national security field during the during the latter days of the Cold War, and I can remember being in the in the Pentagon and involved in planning. I don't know of any circumstance in which such a high percentage of the world's economy is focused in 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 such a small area that's a hundred miles from uh, that would that was a hundred roughly a hundred miles from the border of a potential adversary. I mean, the Soviet Union never had the ability to target one area or one. It's not a facility; it's a set of facilities. It's a you know large uh, 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 factory footing, but the ability that you could target that and cripple the global economy, you know, and one. So when we talk about, you know, Taiwan, uh, yes, we're talking about you know, an emerging democracy. When we talk about Taiwan, yes, we're talking about an American partner for a long, long time. Yes, we're talking about, you know, an arrangement that goes back to when uh, the opening that Richard Nixon had with uh, Mao Zedong and uh, and later with the one China policy that emerges under the Carter administration. But we're also talking about a vulnerability in the world economy that sits right there at TSMC. When we, you know, when we follow the CHIPS Act that this administration has put in place, one of the very important pieces of that is to diversify that global supply chain to begin to have the manufacture uh, manufacturing of advanced chips in places other than just Taiwan. We can argue about whether that's unfolding in the right way and so forth, but the motivation to have you know a more diversified uh, global supply chain for advanced microprocessors is is the right one. But for the moment, there is a very very big vulnerability. Tom, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about the nuclear weapons piece, or I can continue, but... Well, no, thanks, Sandy. On the nuclear weapons piece, Jim, it's a great question. I don't want to get too wonky and Dr. Strangelove here, but for decades, the U.S. and Soviet Union maintained nuclear st stability by matching each other more or less in warheads at very high levels, mutually assured destruction, all of that. China chose a very different path. It chose a minimum deterrence. It fielded only enough nuclear weapons to say, if you attack us, we will be able to do harm to you that you cannot sustain. Well, China has decided to join the club. And as you said, it is building up probably to parity with the US and Russia. And that's why we and others, including General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, gave a speech a couple months ago in which he too described the current era as the most dangerous in American history. And in addition to all the things that we write about, pandemics and, and food crisis and all that, he said that for the first time in world history, the US could be facing not one, but two nuclear rivals fielding enough weapons to wipe out this nation as we know it never happened before and that's terrifying very good and i think it has a it has an effect on our ability to, to deter china from trying to take taiwan i think you lay that out in the book in an interesting way let's talk about some of these other the new threats the germs and the cyber and the so forth one thing i i try to think through is who who would be the actors who would deploy these kinds of of technical or other threats against us. Well, let's let's begin with the germs, you know, or you know, uh, biological threats. Uh, the most advanced laboratories are run by states. Um, you know, it's uh, you'd have to look to Russia, China, North Korea, uh, others that are involved in that. 
yes, there is, there's a legitimate concern about terrorists coming into possession of this. That's a little harder. Um, the, you know, the infrastructure that's required for an actual biological weapons lab isn't something you hide easily, but it doesn't mean that, that, that it's out of reach. And we certainly know at the time of 2001, when the, uh, we were first uh, went into Afghanistan. Some of the things that we found were some experiments with biological organisms and so forth. Uh, and I'm going to let Tom tell the story of uh, former chairman of the Joy Chiefs of Staff that's so motivated by that, the work he's doing. But, you know, I think it's a mixture of both states and potential terrorists. So, you know, back to your original question, Jim, you know, that we don't argue that that element of fixing the part of the national security machine, both warning and action, was wrong. It was uh, what we'll call, I'll, I'll use the, you know, the over attention or even obsession that blocked out other things. But uh, we would certainly want to be attentive to the, to the, you know, the possibility that terrorists could, could employ some of these. But the, but the real scientific work that's going to be behind that is not something that's going to happen in a garage or in a cave somewhere. These, it takes real laboratory work to be doing this, and that's likely going to be states. And I'd like to add one very frightening adversary to the list of state actors and terrorists that Andy mentioned when it comes to the threat of bio or agra threats, and that's Mother Nature. COVID was a naturally occurring illness, as is Ebola, as is wheat blight, as is brucellosis. So it's not impossible an adversary could use that, but there's deep concern across the national security apparatus that Mother Nature may do us more harm than an adversary. Andy referenced a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Dick Myers. After he retired, he was chairman during the invasions of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. He saw all the early intelligence that Al-Qaeda was experimenting with wheat blight and other bioorganisms. He became president of Kansas State University, his home state, and he wrangled oh, a little bit of money, a uh, billion dollars from the US government to build the National Bio Agro Defense Facility, something most people have never heard of. He invited Andy and me out. We toured the facility. It's a state of the art level five containment laboratory where they are researching defenses against bio and agro threats, whether naturally occurring or man made. And General Myers told us an incredible story that really seized him. In the late 90s, New Zealand was overrun with wild rabbits, and the farmers lobbied their government to let them use a hemorrhaging agent that would kill the rabbits by making them bleed to death. Well, the government said, no, it's not environmentally sound. So some of those farmers flew to the Czech Republic, where it was controlled, but you could buy it. They bought some, put it on their handkerchiefs, flew back to New Zealand, and let loose this virulent hemorrhaging agent across New Zealand, and it wiped out the wild rabbit population. So what the, the concerns we're talking about are doable. General Meyer's concerns have already happened in the real world, and Andy and I argue that there's not enough public attention on that, and we're not ready. I just want to add a quick footnote to that. So you, you ask why the laboratory in Kansas State didn't we have it? We did have a laboratory that did that work. It was in New York on Plum Island, except it was so out of date, it was decertified. There was a period of time where we didn't have this research capability. It's now up and running. It's one of the important fixes that needs to happen. But it's one of these things, if you're not focused on the right problems, the right questions, then these things will get away from you. And that's what Myers knew when he argued for this, because they, they knew the facility in, in New York was going to be decertified. Very good. Let's let's talk a little bit. You know, one um one thing you didn't talk about, one, one technology you, which bad actors might use against us that you didn't talk about, but especially with respect to terrorists, is nuclear weapons. Now, I've got the, the bookshelf that's behind me here has a, a, a book written by Brian Michael Jenkins of RAND, a friend of both Andy and, and I, I mean me. And, and Brian, it, the book's titled, Will Terrorists Go Nuclear? And he basically makes the argument, Andy, that you kind of just made that that the it's that building nuclear weapons is too hard for terrorists. It requires a state. 
to put together the laboratories. And I mean, a lot of the people in the audience have probably have seen the movie uh, Oppenheimer. And, um, and Oppenheimer was in charge of the, he was not in charge of the Manhattan Project. He was in charge of the Los Alamos lab, which was with the design facility for nuclear weapons. But the Manhattan Project had a lot more than that. It had other labs, which were all had to be integrated together. Terrorists can't put that kind of thing together. I think that point you made about the the, the actors we have to import, pay more attention to are the are the hostile hostile threats. Any reaction to that? Uh, no, I, I think you've summarized it well, and, and except to say, warning and action. Um, nuclear uh, research on nuclear capabilities is just detectable. You know, we we have ways of finding that. Um, biological weapons harder, harder to detect, but you know, um, through you know, through uh, um, surveillance of various kinds, when facilities are being built in certain areas, you can you can see what's coming and going and that kind of thing. Um, you know, we we can we can find that, but certainly, I mean, I was still in the government at the time when a lot of attention was on North Korea and and. I think for this audience, it's it's enough to say that you know that that was observable that North Korea was working on you know the scientific efforts to be able to produce a nuclear weapon, and similarly, you know when people talk about Iran, uh, Iran and its pursuit of nuclear weapons, um, you know that's all observable too. Well, one more of the, of your uh, new threats is cyber, and uh, I wanted to ask a question. You know, you you in the book you you talk about the fact that for I think at least a decade we have been hearing warnings about the possibility of a cyber Pearl Harbor that there will be some kind of an attack against our infrastructure, uh, maybe the maybe the power grid or some or power grid plus that will will bring it down and cause untold amounts of, of deaths and 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 destruction. And it hasn't happened. And so why hasn't it happened? And what, you know, what do you make of that? I, I absolutely love that question. Thank you. Because it really proves the major thesis of our book, which is that how you define a problem defines the options, by which I mean it limits the options. By defining it as awaiting a cyber Pearl Harbor, some gigantic sneak attack that would be unmistakable, we missed what was really going on, which is the Chinese cyber theft of intellectual property totaling in the trillions of dollars. This one of the cyber Pearl Harbors that's been going for 10 years has been quiet. Corporations don't talk about it, but China has been able to make leaps ahead in technology through that cyber Pearl Harbor that nobody saw. It's not a surprise that the newest generation Chinese stealth fighter looks exactly like ours. And so when you talk about cyber weapons and cyber war, it really does limit our ability to counter it. One of the most devastating cyber attacks in recent years was the hacking of Colonial Pipeline. Shot up gas prices all over. That was a criminal group, probably aided and abetted by, by Russia, but it, it, was, it could have been catastrophic and it wasn't a state actor, it wasn't an attack. And then that raises another point that Andy and I make, which is the need for greater public-private partnership to deal with these problems. Because when it comes to cyber, when it comes to AI, the government has a lot of capability, but a lot of the intellectual heft is in the private sector where it's protected for stockholder value. We have to come to some new rules of the road so that the government and private industry can communicate better when things are good and bad to keep us safer. Just a footnote, you know, Jim, there is also, I think this audience ought to be aware, we haven't had the lights out, but we've had a lot of probing. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of smaller activity. And it's not, I, I'm not here to suggest the lights out couldn't happen. But, you know, smaller disruptions can have big, big effects. I, I really, I think that the example Tom points to a colonial pipeline, that was... Uh, you know, interference in a distribution process of, you know, of, of gasoline on the East Coast. Uh, it didn't last a long, long time, but as somebody who lives on the East Coast, uh, you know, there were parts of, you know, areas in, in which there was no gasoline. And, you know, that was a fairly minor probing. So I think it's real. We haven't seen the lights out. I, Tom's right. 
uh, while that was happening, there was this major intellectual property theft theft that was underway. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 something that really has to be watched. And 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 this is a case, by the way, where you know the machine isn't yet been built, and it's it's hard. We'll get back to it. I know you're going to want to go there, but this is one where it's going to take a lot of effort. And not clear that you know just having you know the next czar in the White House is going to solve that one. Well, let's talk about what should we should be done. You you've uh, argued, I think, uh, correctly that many of the threats that uh, have emerged recently are are not handled by the by the machines, but are instead on, almost on an ad hoc basis. Use use the term like a pickup game. And and that um, good example, of course, was the 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 machinery that existed or existed in, in before the Trump administration on pandemics was not was was not used uh, when we we faced the real pandemic. We instead had a pickup game. We created a, a council in the White House and and the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Response, who's one of the people who's supposed to be doing you know be be part of both warning and action machines was was sort of sidelined so so what do we need to do now to avoid pickup games how do we integrate into the system national security system these new new threats and new actors i'd like to begin i let me go backwards just a little bit on this question backwards as in uh, this was a problem us military had uh, you know, coming out of Vietnam and certainly after the Iranian rescue, for those in the audience that are going to you know, remember that, the, uh, you know, how the military was interacting, you know, across the military services, uh, the kind of planning and coordination you would expect, the preparedness and so forth, certainly during the, after the Iran hostage rescue crisis that was disastrous, there was a real attention to you know, how do you take the pieces that are the Defense Department and make them work as a whole? Uh, the reform was known as Goldwater Nichols, uh, that, that, and that shorthand gets used all the time for those in defense circles. They'll talk about Goldwater Nichols. What those, what that really was about, was a set of reforms to create the the uh, structures in in the uh, across the U.S. military to allow for the military services to be knit together to for air, sea, land, space, cyber to be coordinated. And that's done through the combatant command organizations. And it's known in, in military circles as jointness, making joint capability out of pieces. We want to take that model and move it across the national government and even across the nation. Tom's point earlier about public-private contributions. You know, we would like to have you know, jointness across agencies. That means having standing activities where there's, you know, the person responsible. Jim, I'm, I'm delighted you mentioned, you know, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. One of the reforms from last summer as we were finishing writing this book was to make that an agency activity to, to recognize it's not just the person, but that's where you want that planning activity to be housed. But it's going to take others. And in the case of public health, it's not just coordinating across the federal government. It's federal, state, local activities. It's the private sector that has to be part of that. But just as the military plans and prepares and exercises and measures its readiness, um, you know, has investments in stockpiles and so forth for contingencies, um, we want to see, you know, similar kind of activities for these problems. We're not calling for making whole new government departments what we want to do is take the parts of the government that are responsible and begin knitting and knit them together. Um, in a different parlance, some will refer, refer to these as, you'll hear the term GIADF. That means Joint Interagency Task Forces. Uh, you know, that would be to take, you know, a lesson from what the military did to, to knit the, this, the military services together, this jointness, but do it in an interagency approach across the government and with the private sector, and in those instances where it flows down to states and localities to have them included too. Practice this before we face the crisis. You got a better chance of succeeding. 
Just a couple of asterisks on this. One reason Andy and I like this idea, and it's one that we're pressing on Capitol Hill and everywhere we go, is it wouldn't cost a lot more money because these people already have their day jobs at the various agencies and departments. It's bringing them together in the way that Operation Warp Speed did, belatedly, but effectively, to get us the vaccine. And it raises just a couple of points I'd love to leave with, with your members here about what we need to do. So that's a structural proposal that Andy and I have. The other is that when we talk about the warning and action machine, we're talking about people. And there's never been a more important time in our history to get the right people into the top jobs, the policy jobs, the staff positions. Andy and I are not left, right, center, Democrat, Republican. This is an apolitical call to get quality in our government officials. And the second thing that we really call for, most of our elected officials, their decision cycle is that day or the next news cycle or between now and the election. And these problems are coming at us in a way that the future has to have a seat at the table. There has to be somebody who can say to the president, to the cabinet members, hey, yes, that's the problem on page one of New York Times today or alerting on CNN that these other problems around the corner that we have to prepare for now so they don't become the page one crisis. And the time has passed. We have to do it now because you know, the future demands a seat at the table. Thank you. Well, Rachel, I think we can now go to some of the, see what questions we have from the audience. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and for the next 20 minutes or so. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I want to jump right into the audience questions. We have a, a couple first related to your book. Um, the first question is, are the policymakers in D.C. listening to you and shifting gears, or do they think you are crying wolf? Um, as an example, they ask, has intel on Russia been increased um, from where it was in 2014? So oh. I think, yeah, why don't you take that, Tom? Yeah. I mean, Andy made the very good point about how before the invasion of Ukraine last year, the CIA director, William Burns, was incredibly effective declassifying intel on the Russian buildup to show to Ukrainians, to Europe, and to the American population. And that actually did several things. One, it took away any element of surprise that Putin might have had. It got world opinion on the side of the Ukrainians. And institutionally, it did a lot to um, wipe away the stain of the CIA-backed briefing that Colin Powell gave to the UN about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. I mean, what Ambassador Director Burns did was show the CIA can do extremely good work. And I've heard him speak in public, and he says one reason he's a good CIA director is because he was an ambassador for so many years. As a consumer of intelligence, he knows how to manage it. And so he really was the right person at the right time. And clearly, there are a lot more eyeballs on Putin and Russia than there were in 2014. Uh, Rachel, there are pockets in Washington and elsewhere, but in Washington, of people that are really zeroing in on this. We haven't touched on artificial intelligence in the camera. They're serious people really trying to understand how you can put guardrails around that. Um, they're they're thinking and, and acting on that. You know, one of the people we feature in the book is uh, Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google. Um, he's very active in this debate. You know, there's communities doing that. There are commissions that have been formed. We've met, Tom and I have met with some of the folks on commissions that are thinking about longer term strategy. How do we organize to deal with these challenges? And again, I want to echo Tom's point. We don't begin with the assumption that we ought to spend more money. We begin with the assumption we ought to organize to deal with the problems that we see today. If it requires more spending, fine, but we don't, let's not begin the, you know, there. Uh, let's get the responsible parties organized in a way to be thinking about, you know, ready, capable responses to the challenges when, we, when they arrive. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think I'm encouraged in the sense that there are serious people focusing on how to put the right mechanisms in place to deal with the challenges we outline. You mentioned artificial intelligence, and one audience member just asked, 
How significant is the contribution of artificial intelligence to the efforts to correct the issues that you are raising? I think both. <laughs> there's two sides to it. You know, the enormous, enormous potential that artificial intelligence offers. You can think of its application in so many different ways in almost all walks of life. But of course, it, there are enormous, enormous risks. We outline, um, you know, we take readers through the case that Schmidt outlined for us of, you know, how you could use artificial intelligence and train the, 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 the machines to perhaps focus on the production of a virus that's only contagious by certain parts of the population. That that's again, that's not something going to be done in a garage or in a in a cave, but that's something that states could do, and that capability will be there. You know, how do you how do you begin to guard against that? Uh, you know, we're going to see AI being used in everything we do. So to the to the I think to the great question from the audience, it is going to help with dealing with some of these challenges. But in the meantime. We, there is a moment in time uh, in which if we're going to get guardrails in place, we've got to do that. Some of that's going to require policy. The people that are that are deep into this also think there are it can be designed into the technology itself. The next set of advanced microprocessors can be designed in ways that might help protect against some of the some of the worst dangers that people can imagine. And I, I know that members of the LA World Affairs Council are looking at this with sophistication, but I was a bit troubled when the AI story broke a news some months ago, chat GPT, the whole debate was, will it do my kids homework? Will it tell my dog to break up with me? Will it compose a symphony? I mean, those to me are not really the important questions. They just don't matter. Because believe it or not, AI is already part of the American military. The HIMARS air defense system that we gave to Ukraine has AI, because there's no human fast enough with an iPad calculator abacus to see an incoming missile and calculate the trajectory for the, the defense. That has to be AI. It's programmed into HIMARS. It can tell the difference between a Russian missile and a civilian airliner. It's already there. Andy and I use the phrase, eyes on, hands off. There's no operator touching buttons, but it's being observed the whole time. But the problem is, as the threats come faster, China's hypersonic missiles, Russian hypersonic missiles, we don't have defenses for them. At some point, we will have to let AI make decisions at a higher level of armament. And those programs are only as good as the designers. And that's where you get into deep, deep concerns about taking humans out of the decision loop when it comes to launching weapons. And we should all be concerned about that. Thank you both, that's fascinating. Another question about the technology, why doesn't the US plant a honeypot of technical designs on a next-gen fighter that is intentionally designed to be flawed, but in such a way that our adversaries can't detect it? They went on to add that malfunctions would look like a normal equipment failure and the, our adversaries could buy or steal those plants. Uh, really? I love the idea. I don't know how to pull it off, but I do love the idea. Uh, you know, uh, deception, denial, it's as old as, you know, humankind is. Um, there are ways to do that. You know, I think of where you're living. I, I, you know, worked at RAM for almost 20 years and uh, have become familiar with the greater LA area, you know, there was a way in which the the now the Santa Monica, Air, Santa Monica Airport was camouflaged during World War II. It wasn't done with AI, but um, to the visible eye, it didn't look like an airport. Uh, you know, we can use modern technology, you know, to to uh, deceive in you know in creative ways like that. Um, you know, I'm not you know steeped enough to know quite how to pull it off, but I like the idea. Well, I'm, I'm going to be a little more cynical. I don't think we have to consciously design advanced weapon systems with flaws to fool our adversaries. We're doing that with most of our modern weapon systems. So turning back um, a bit to the politics, this audience member asks, do election cycles and administration shifts impact focus and prioritization of these long-term challenges? 
Are there certain better windows of opportunity for timing to address coordination needs and shifts in priorities? So the answer is, of course, yes. And again, I want to restate that Andy and I approach this book nonpartisan, apolitical, but clearly administrations come in with points of view. As far as when we should deal with these shifts, I would say now. And I would say that it's very, very important for this country to at least recall wonderful periods in the past when Democrats and Republicans came together in a bipartisan way for a centrist foreign policy. They might have argued at the margins, they might have argued over tax policy, but when it came to the big threats in the world, they came together. Think about Nunn Lugar, a Democratic senator, senator, a Republican senator, came together to denuclearize the former Soviet states after the collapse of communism. One of the greatest diplomatic victories for peace and security in modern history but it was only done in a bipartisan fashion. I yearn for a return to that. I mean, just uh, echoing a bit and, and expanding a bit, continuity of policy is, is absolutely essential. And just because uh, the last administration had done it, done it some way doesn't mean it has to be changed in the next one. There's been some continuity. Um, you know, we can begin to see that in how we think about China policy from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. There was not all things, but a lot of things. There was continuity in policy. That's important. Um, and continuity in preparation for the kind of problems we talk about. Uh, I, I think for many of these issues, I would prefer that they not become issues of day-to-day -day presidential politics. We need sort of the, the continuing steady effort and preparation that happens in, in uh, you know, across administrations uh, uh, so that we're prepared in various ways. I, you know, the, the idea that our public health preparedness has become politicized in the way that it has is really concerning to me. I mean, these are the, some of these things that we talk about in the book about having reasonable stockpiles of, you know, personal protective equipment. You know, you think about vaccines of various kinds to at least have had the research underway, to know what the production capabilities are going to be, how the distribution is going to unfold. We've got some of that worked out now. Let's not lose what we've learned. We really need to sustain that knowledge. This won't be, by the way, COVID-19 is not going to be the last time that this country is going to be challenged by, uh, you know, by, you know, uh, uh, a, a pandemic threat. Uh, and they, you know, as Tom pointed out, um, these don't, you know, these are, you know, is more often naturally occurring than they are, you know, threats from from individuals or countries. Uh, you know, the next pandemic threat will come. And, and Rachel, if I could just sort of add to that as well, we haven't talked about climate change yet. And I know that in California, it's a huge concern. And Andy and I make the case that climate security is national security. And it's really painful here in Washington to see how politicized it is between climate deniers and tree 